Fish Ponds, Bristol. The mention of its name conjures up urban cheek in the way we think of the South Bank in Paris or Greenwich Village in New York. Already the listener is transported to avant-garde acting studios or struggling artists about to conquer the literary world. Hardly. It is essentially a suburb located three miles from the centre and largely residential. It is made up of Victorian terraces, but it boasts two Victorian-era parks, including Eastville and Vassal Park. As its name implies, it used to have fish ponds as a result of quarries in the area. Due to population expansion, these were filled in during the 19th century, but the name stuck. Our story today involves every parent's nightmare. The abduction and murder of a child. We all expect to outlive our children, but not our parents. It does not bear thinking about. Over to you, James, to relay this ghastly story. In 1924, it was the year in which George Gershwin first performed Rhapsody in Blue, and Adolf Hitler was sentenced to five years' imprisonment for his part in the Barrel Putsch. Cultural and political events would eventually affect everybody, but seemed to have passed fish bombs in Bristol by at the time, or indeed at any other time. On the 15th of December of that year, Mr and Mrs Amos lived with their three sons, Willie, aged 11, Gilbert, aged 8 and a half, and Walter, aged 2, at Burr Hill Cottages in Staple Hill. On the night in question, they went out and left their eldest son to babysit and put the boys to bed. At about nine o'clock in the evening, a caller appeared at the door and asked Willie to come over to their Aunt Lizzie's, who lived in nearby Portland Street, as she had a present for them. Willie was conscious of his responsibilities as a babysitter and could not leave the house. Instead, the second eldest, Gilbert, agreed to go and see Aunt Lizzie with the caller. When the Amoses returned home, they were concerned to see that Gilbert was missing. Immediately they went round to Aunt Lizzie's house and were told that she had been out all evening and denied ever sending the message or seeing Gilbert at all. The alarmed couple frantically searched until about two o'clock the next morning when they alerted the police. A body had been found and the father was taken to Fishpond's police station and identified the body as that of his son, Gilbert. He had not only been strangled, but also sodomised. Meanwhile, elsewhere, on Sandwell Road, another family was looking for a son. In this case, he was 21 years of age. Mrs. Bressington became agitated as to his non-appearance at the house. Charles Bressington and a friend, William Britton, went to find young William, which they did near a local boot factory. But matters turned very sinister. William announced to his father certain words that would be disputed later at the trial. Nevertheless, he led the trio of men to Cousins Field, where they found the body of a boy. The father flew into a rage and attacked his son. The friend rushed to a nearby police station to summon help. The trial of William Bressington took place on the 16th of February 1925. Before it could get going, Bressington entered a guilty plea. This put the judge in an awkward position, as he would have to don the black cap and send the culprit to the gallows. This was not normal procedure, as the jury would have no say in the matter. A not guilty plea was entered instead. Two witnesses stated that Bressington had mentioned the presence of another party to the murder, though the names of James or Charlie were of not much use. After Mr Amos and his son Willie and Aunt Lizzie were called as witnesses, it was the turn of the father of the accused, Charles Bressington. He claimed that his son had said, I have done it, Daddy, I have done it. I cannot tell you, but I will take you to the place and show you. This contradicted other witnesses, who claimed the words used were either I've done it, Daddy, or I've done wrong. The latter was used in the opening speech by the prosecution, 
to start the trip to the gallows. But what was not in doubt is that William Bressington was not as other men. His father described him as odd from a baby onwards. There was a history of insanity in the family, and William was definitely part of the family tradition. He had been picked up before by the police and brought home after wandering off. He was also well known in the area for strange behaviour, such as wearing women's clothing and makeup. As you can imagine, he was a troubled individual who had tried to commit suicide at the age of 15. In 1919, he had enlisted in the army, but was discharged for being feeble minded. Let us move on to the other witnesses. Dr. William Cotton, the medical superintendent at Hawfield Prison, described the accused as unbalanced rather than insane, even though Bressington had been put under suicide watch. Dr. Robert Phillips of Northwood Asylum felt that Bressington was a mental defective, as he put it, who could not distinguish between right and wrong. Accordingly, he would have no hesitation in certifying the accused insane. The medical superintendent of Bristol Mental Institution, who examined the accused shortly before the trial, noted that he freely admitted his guilt, yet seemed unattached as to the gravity of his crime. Hearing all the evidence, the jury retired for an hour, and when they returned, they gave a verdict of guilty, but with a plea of mercy. Mr Justice Roche, the judge, replied that this would be considered in the right quarters. Despite the plea, William Bessington was hanged on the 31st of March 1925 for the murder of Gilbert Amos. The hangman was the renowned Thomas Pierpoint. Now John, this is a horrifying story. Can you sum it all up for us? One of the great problems of history is judging people in the past by our own standards. As L.P. Hartley once put it in the Gobertrine, the past is a foreign country. They do things differently. If one is examining feudal society, it is obviously made up of knights. But what would one make of bailiffs, reeves, cottagers, etc.? It is certainly a foreign country. And if we used Doctor Who's TARDIS, we would have great difficulty understanding anyone. But let us go back to 1924. We certainly could understand them as we have sound recordings from that era. The country was still not a democracy as women only could get the vote at the age of 30. But it had a modern feel as there were cars, trains, telephones, cinema and aeroplanes. But people's attitudes were completely different. If you were 40 years old in 1924 you would remember not only the Great War, but also the Boer War. You would have certainly pointed at the sky on seeing an aeroplane for the first time. You would have known about the Oscar Wilde scandal at the beginning of the century. There was no LGBT plus talk in those days, but whispers of the love that dare not speak its name. Many people went to church and the role of religious leaders was important. This leads on to the role of the Home Secretary, William Johnson Hicks, popularly known as Jix. Despite a plea by the jury of a guilty verdict, with a recommendation of mercy regarding Bressington's weak mentality, he went to the gallows on the 11th of March 1925. To contemporaries, Jix was a popular politician who had the interests of the public at large. As a Home Secretary, he took his responsibilities seriously. He visited every single prison and established borstals for young offenders and a probation officer in each court. His act enabled shop assistants not to work after 8pm and forced employers to give them half a day's holiday each week. He clashed with Winston Churchill over greyhound racing which he favoured as it kept the working class out of pubs. He repealed regulations that specified that chocolates could not be served in the first interval at theatres. He was opposed to books on birth control and took an active interest in censoring indecent literature such as Radcliffe Hall's lesbian work, The Well of Loneliness. The editor of the Sunday Express 
James Douglas expressed the view that I'd rather give a healthy boy or girl a file of Prusik acid than this novel. Basically, the popular dailies approved of him in sharp contrast to the weeklies. Today, he would be regarded as a complete reactionary prudish lunatic. Part of the problem is that the family have not allowed his papers to be viewed by historians until recently, and critics have rubbished him. He was admired in his day for his views on the revised Book of Common Prayer, which was debated in Parliament. Does anyone think that such a debate would occur today? But let us examine his role in the case of Bressington. He was able to overturn a plea of mercy by a jury and did not have to justify his action other than scribble on the file, justice must take its course. He was under no obligation to accept the findings of the Home Office psychiatrists. He was able to act as a Roman emperor, turning his thumb down and condemning the poor wretch to the afterlife. The Court of Appeal could only overturn the jury's verdict on the grounds of misdirection by the judge or new evidence being introduced. But the culprit had to be released and the courts had no means of reducing the sentence. The Home Secretary enjoyed this wonderful privilege. Were there any guidelines for the Home Secretary to follow? Apparently not. The Prime Minister could and still does appoint Home Secretaries not on their ability but their position within the party. Jiggs was certainly an experienced solicitor and had made his name as a motoring expert. But not all Home Secretaries are legally trained. James Callaghan, who served in the role under Harold Wilson or... Theresa May under David Cameron were just party hacks. It is amazing that a Home Secretary could dismiss a local jury who surely must have witnessed harrowing evidence and yet pleaded mercy. In The Merchant of Venice, there is a famous quotation of the quality of mercy is not strained. But in this case, it is not just strained but tainted. <laughs> <laughs>